Greetings, listeners, and welcome to Roll of a Tangent, episode 25. My name is Nikita Zuev, and, I, and tonight I am once again joined by my glorious co-hosts, Robert Gibson and XJ. Thank you for coming, guys. Um, today, we will be doing something uh, slightly different, uh, my dear uh, viewers and listeners. Uh, our task is to compare two works of fiction uh, instead of one in the same episode, but the ones that are quite connected. The first one is Casting the Runes, a horror sh uh, short story by M.R. James, written in 1911. You might remember M.R. James by the Lost Hearts um, short story that we reviewed uh, quite early on. I think it was episode 8 or something. The other is adaptation to the silver screen uh, of the casting uh, the runes, and that is Night of the Demon, or Curse of the Demons, uh, if you watched it in the US. A thriller created in 1957 and directed by, and I'm going to butcher his name, Jacques Turner? I'm not very sure. Jacques Turner. Oh, there we go. Jacques Turner. So, the proper um, French me... way. Very, very French. So let me first discuss Casting the Runes. So Casting the Runes is a slow-paced short story that takes time, uh, you know, like to sort of get going, to unravel. And it depicts um, a researcher from the British Museum by the name of Edward uh, Dunning, who had recently rejected a, uh, a work uh, called The Truth of Alchemy, which was submitted by some guy named Mr. Carswell, who we'll let, later find out is actually a powerful sorcerer, or so he claims. Shortly after, Dunning learns that another reviewer of the work, John Harrington, died in a freak accident after three months uh, of, of the review, which further spooks uh, our hero. Now haunted by a carnival who remains off screen for the most of the story, Dunning sets on the path to get to the bottom of the runes that have been cast upon him. In the end, Harrington's brother uh, collaborates with Dunning and they defeat Carswell with a clever ruse uh, where they sort of <clears throat> conspire against him and place the curse uh, upon him. Robert, uh, could you describe Night of the Demon for our listeners? Yep. Night of the Demon, the film of 1957, begins with the death of Professor Harrington, who in this version is not a mere book reviewer, but is actively investigating Carswell's de demonic cult. The... Uh, the death occurs not several years before the start of the story, but is actually part of the story. Mm. Um, the professor had just begged Carswell to spare his life from a curse. And uh, this that's the opening scene. And shortly after, uh, having failed to convince Carswell to do so, he um, meets his end at the... Mm hands of the demon. Actually, Carswell may have been willing to spare him if this Harrington had been um, had had the the runes, the key uh, sign of the curse, ready to give back. But he hadn't. He'd lost them or, or they'd been destroyed. And that was it for Harrington. He could no can't give them back because he hasn't got them anymore. So anyway, the demon comes for Harrington, and uh, in the movie, uh, instead of Dunning, we have an American, Dr. John Holden, who arrives in England for a convention at which the late Professor Harrington had been planning to expose Carswell's cult. Uh, he learns that Harrington has died, supposedly in a power line accident and begins his inquiries into the matter with the help of Harrington's niece, Gina, uh, who is quite liable to believe that something horrible has happened to her uncle. Uh, Holden goes about uncovering the mystery of the cult, and he is gradually weaned from his scepticism mm. into a growing belief that there's something real behind the horror. And in the end, uh, in a scene which actually does resemble the climax of the story, the um, uh, the runes are given back 
to Carswell without his knowledge. Mm. And uh, that's it. The demon comes for Carswell instead. So there we are. And uh, it now remains for us to uh, be um, uh, very careful what we say. In the <laughs> <of the podcast. laughs> okay, understood. Uh, I want to give you one little bit of trivia before we uh, we go to uh, to discuss both of these works. And I mean, I think in the end of the pod- uh, at the end of the podcast, uh, we will have to say which version we preferred and why. I think that that makes the most mm-hmm. sense, right? Like because we're comparing them. But um, um, one of the trivias regarding the, the movie itself was um, so the original screenplay was written by Charles Bennett who at the time who was, was a British national. And at the time he, he had the rights to casting the runes um, and he gave it to, to his American co- colleagues to turn into the movie. And uh, Hal E. Chester, the person who sort of like redrafted the screenplay, said that it was too tame and uh, Robert, uh, hold on to something, too British. Uh, and he wasn't very happy with it. And he was the person who added all the stuff with the with the demon being showed at the beginning and at the end. And <laughs> very unusually, Charles Bennett was so angry with the changes to the script by the by this producer that in an interview he said, "If Chester uh, walked up my driveway right now, I'd shoot him dead." That's that's how upset he was by by these changes. Yes, so, uh, and. Uh... And uh, one would think that he wouldn't be above casting a little bit of a runes himself, mm. wouldn't he? <laughs> and yet, it's a great movie. There's no doubt about that. Mm. Uh, I, uh, I've got nothing, nothing at all to say against the movie. Even the, even the demon. I'm quite happy with the demon, really. Um, some people... Oh yeah, the, I really like the effect. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh... It's like the, it's like the dinosaurs in King Kong. You sort of feel. Uh, the original King Kong, I mean, you know, they they may be a bit jerky, but you know, one feels a f- affection for them. Yeah, gets the job done. Mm. Uh, Martin Scorsese lists uh, this uh, beautiful work of art, this movie, uh, as one of his favorite horror movies. Uh, mm-hmm. So you know, you're in good company, uh, Robert. Um, I guess I'll start. So uh, I read the. Um, uh, the short story twice. I first read it uh, during my stay at a at a really nice sauna uh, that I go to uh, every Saturday or Sunday, um, and you know it was sort of like a relaxing time that I've had with it. Uh, the first time, you know, I was reading it quite slowly, and then um, you know I read it about uh, two days ago uh, before before the podcast, and my overall impression remained uh, that the the short story is slow paced very slow paced slow paced to the point where um compared to his other work uh lost hearts um i i feel like it meanders in some bits now some of that is pretty good i like the prologue i like the idea that we get to explore other characters who are not involved in the story talking about before the story begins i I quite like that the concept um you know it's quite interesting that way uh but at the same time I, I kind of feel like we're, we're not really getting the, the juicy bits of the story. It kind of, it kind of feels to me that uh, things get dragged out uh, quite, quite a little bit before we get to uh, the interesting stuff at the end. Um, what I liked about it, uh, I would say the, the ending is quite nice. The, the way the ambiguity, how, how it sort of like holds you on to the fact that you don't really know if any of this is supernatural or if it just freak accidents that have occurred, right? But on the other hand, uh, it also keeps you uh, guessing as to whether or not um, our hero is, is going to make out of it. Because um, although uh, he he seems to be uh, quite quite spooked uh, when he when he reaches the brother um, of the of the first victim. Uh, his his um, uh, sort of affirmations about this perhaps being a uh, some sort of a hoax uh, don't don't really go anywhere because uh, the brother is just as scared and when uh, he tells him like oh oh God don't say to me that Carswell is this guy 
that um, that you were reviewing the book for. You know, like you can, I can imagine in my in my mind this, this conversation happening. So I really like that bit for sure. Um, that's that's my thoughts on the on the on the short story. Yeah, uh, just just to it. interrupt you there, Nikki. That's uh, the bit you just mentioned. He says, "Don't tell me the man was called Carswell. Why not? That's exactly his name." Henry Harrington leant back. That is final to my mind. Hmm. That's that's well put. Yeah, very. I I really like that exchange. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for reading it out. Um, Night of the Demon, uh, much more action packed uh, compared to the story, right? It, I mean, it was um, the screenplay was written like forty years after uh, the fact of the the short story being uh, published, right? So the <clears throat> the taste buds of of the viewership has uh, changed. Mm. obviously right and there's a lot of silly moments actually in the movie uh there's this this whole like scene with the fortune teller stuff which i didn't quite like but i th i mean at least it, it broke out the pace um and there were of course the uh, uh these very cliche now uh j jump scares where nothing really happens but you know somebody somebody scares you uh, out of nowhere like with the kid in the skeleton mask and stuff like that right uh, which, I mean, isn't actually scary, but because it happens so suddenly in the movie, you know, and you know it's a horror movie, you get the jitters slightly. Uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, I I personally didn't like the fact that they uh, showed the fact that this is supernatural right at the start. I think that is the biggest um, sort of like misstep when it comes to the movie itself. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it is it, it was quite striking. Um, it was really, really eerie, the first scene, seeing that demon slowly approaching for the first time. I really liked that. That was mm. pretty good. Despite the fact that overall, I wouldn't have that scene. Just the way it was filmed. Uh, mm. I quite enjoyed that. I, th mm. I think I've spoken on long enough. So how much did you hate both of these things, XJ? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes? You hated the Yes. <laughs> I actually like the story, uh, the short story, much better than I mm. like the movie. Uh, so, what do I like about the short story? Well, first of all, again, M. R. James has uh, just this very beautiful style of writing. Uh, it's it's very it's very lyrical and um, it just uh, it 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 just uh, it he he has a way of writing that is that is very similar to uh, Clark Ashton Smith and it is a beautiful way of writing and it's very relaxing for me to slip into that mode. It's, uh, it's a bit bombastic for, 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 for probably for the modern reader where the sentences are short and punchy and straight to the point. But I have a weak spot for beautifully crafted uh, Pros, so mm -hmm. there. Uh, uh, I really like how there is so much tension built at the end near the uh, in the train scene where mm -hmm. they were trying to give back the curse to Carswell uh, between Harrington and uh, what's his name Dunsworth Dunsworth Dunning Dunning, Dunning. Dunning. yeah. yeah. So, so despite the fact that there is literally no action at all, M.R. James still manages to create tension. And I think that is something worth um, uh, uh, highlighting. It's like, it, I mean, when, when, when we sit down and think about it, what was the scene really about? Just a couple of guys trying to slip a piece of paper into somebody else's uh, package. There's, uh, there's no uh, shootouts. There's no explosions. There's none of that stuff. Very, very non-violent. Mm -hmm. And yet, there is still this incredible amount of tension built within that scene. And I think that is uh, penmanship of the highest caliber. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, o the only problem I have with the short story is how it seems to jump from uh, scene to scene sometimes without any uh, 
connection in between like uh, uh, the very abrupt way it went from uh, the the conversation between the uh, the secretary and her employer uh, right in the beginning of the story and then it kind of just jump straight away to to uh dunning yeah i think the 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 author literally writes okay that was a prologue anyway so yeah this was happening. <laughs> and then he just sort of <laughs> jump and i'm like huh what yeah that's right he says uh, uh let's hope it won't occur to him i that uh it, dunning was the one who reviewed his book unfavorably however mr carswell was an astute man and then there's a line missed out uh, a little gap and then this much is in the way of prologue well <laughs> it's like, what? You're in the hands of the storyteller you see the storyteller can say what he likes sure but that was like uh that that's a little bit lazy mr james <laughs> just a little bit lazy anyway uh i thought just a, aside from that very abrupt jump uh there were a couple of others as well but i can't recall them at the moment there were a lot of uh, yeah. yeah. There was just like this two, um, this this few uh, breaks that I I thought it was like, hmm, yeah. I just mm. kind of break broke my immersion there, and uh, that was the only um, criticism I have of the short story. The other the other thing that I the last thing I really like about it actually is it starts off. Um, like a, it reminds me a little bit of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, or the way it starts off. It's a bit journaly, like yeah, hmm. yeah, a bit, yeah. A lot of his stories are like that. Yeah, yeah. it's a bit journaly, like, and then you sort of see like uh, uh, it's like reading somebody else's letters, and then you're trying to piece a story together, which I think is a very nice. Uh, uh, a very very nice uh, uh, storytelling technique actually because it makes it more it's a much more active way of reading I feel because you have to piece things together in 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 uh, well in my mind anyway yeah mm. yeah Call of Cthulhu does that quite well yeah mm. uh, for the uh, movie oh, yeah. here we go it sucks what? Yeah, it fucking sucks, man. That's it? That's all you got? Yeah. That's, that's your entire review? No. More. There's more. Uh, so first, that demon shouldn't have been there in the first scene, man. It just killed everything for me. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Okay. And unfortunately, uh, professionally, I'm a VFX uh, artist. And you can't... <laughs> once, you, once you become a VFX artist, there's no turning back. You watch movies, you turn on your critical eye. I just yeah yeah there's just no 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 going back man and uh so so two things one it's like uh this is very specific to me the moment I saw that puppet I'm like yeah uh, I can't take this as real man and so that killed any of the horror whatever it is that they were trying to do with that thing it just like completely destroys it for me because when I look at that, the only thing I can think of was how far has technology <laughs> jumped? And it's not is and it's not to say that their um, animatronics doesn't have charms. It is it, it can be incredibly charming, but not in a horror movie context. But I suppose way back then, it's I suppose way back then is a it's a. Uh, <sighs> Uh, uh, it's a fresh and on the screen or whatever. But right now, when I watch it, it's like yeah. the, okay. other thing, the, other, the other the other thing, the other the other thing, the other thing. No, 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 no. The no. other thing, the other thing, is I wish, I wish filmmakers realize more the power of not showing. Oh. Yeah, you know, like. Like to me, I when I watch an American horror movie versus when I watch a Japanese horror movie, there's like a mm. world of difference. Like I saw The Ring, 
the original one and then the american remake and i'm like when i watch american remake i'm like Mm. That was my face throughout the whole movie. And those of you listening, you have to tune in to watch. Yeah. Uh, anyway, when I watched the Japanese version, I couldn't sleep for weeks. It was that creepy. And there were no special effects in the first movie. Uh, aside from um, uh, the way... Uh, Sad- Sadoka? Yeah. Sadoka got out of the well, which they actually did by running the film backwards. Uh, they filmed her walking backwards and then run, run the, uh, run the film backwards so that she's she seems like she's coming out of the well instead of going backwards into the well, and her movements were quite creepy then. But the whole but like the show was so creepy without any fancy techniques, and to me, to me, horror has to live in the mind uh, of the audience. When you start sketching out too much stuff, it, just, it kills everything. And that is, that is the biggest problem with the, with the Night of the Demons, even if I don't take into consideration the VFX thing. Showing the demon right from the start, that may have been uh, really titillating to American audience because I think at that time when it was released... Uh, uh, animatronics was like uh, this huge big thing back then. Uh, the uh, R- uh, Ray Harryhausen's work was like uh, super popular. Uh, Jason and the Argonauts, that was a great film, by the way. Uh, and basically, all of those stuff, everybody wanted them. And then and maybe that was why they included that in the beginning, but it really killed the suspense. Further, further, uh, some really interesting changes. You noticed, uh, uh, it was uh, like the the second protagonist was changed to a woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, that it's so obvious why. It's like otherwise, there's no that you can't uh, develop a a, a romantic uh, component of the movie if it's just two guys. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you could, but probably not in 1957. Yeah, uh, it's a, a lot of the reasons why the script was changed the way it did was like, mm, yeah, I I know why you guys did that. I know why you did. I don't that. I don't agree with you on that. I think there's also the understanding that you know there are two genders working in the industry, and you want to have a leading lady as well. Uh so not 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 during that time, uh, Nikki. I can assure you. Yeah, no. The, the, I mean, the, okay. the only, you, the only, that, the on. in biggest. That case, I I gave you a time to speak. Uh, in that case, you would say then the uh, the mother of Carzel was put there for eye candy. Or no, look. Yeah. The so, yeah, the 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 the, the reason it. the reason why uh, it was changed to a niece is really because in that t- during that time in the movie, one of the key components is there must be. A romantic relationship within the film that's how it is it was it was it was that time it was the it was in the it, it was in the beginning of the screen era and and at, the one thing about films that uh a lot of films at that time was is very formulaic especially if it's coming out of hollywood hmm. well, i think it's right though because um joanna has a uh, an important part to play in that she uh, helps to get Dr. Holden to listen. I mean, he's very reluctant to listen to anything outside his original little box of scientific thought. And mm. she contributes to saving his life from that point of view. There is some... Of course, when they adapt the short story to the screen and they write in a woman instead of of uh of following the actual st- the the initial story of course the new character has to do something and they change uh Dunning's character from just a simple researcher of witchcraft into a full-blown uh Professor. skeptical 
professor of the sciences and blah 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 and all that. It's 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 so of course there is that uh, um, mm. tension. It's like a character arc. He must travel from his position of skepticism into the position of uh, acceptance to in order to be able to face down the demon and stuff like that. It's like sure, yeah, well, it's mm. okay. Why not? And uh, mm. and I'm not I'm not knocking the fact that they changed uh, uh, Harrington's brother to his to his niece. It's just like yeah, very transparent to me why they did so and um and uh, uh i found and i found the uh transition from caswell from this uh crochetti uh uh countryside uh weirdo english countryside weirdo into this uh actually relatively nice guy if you only got to know him on the surface and only later on if when you know he's an actual wishcraft guy then it becomes a bit different because like the the way the way the scene with the children was very different from the story mm. yeah Caswell yeah. in the Caswell in the short story was way more of an asshole yeah that's that's the one thing that wasn't really didn't really get noticed by the movie director the potential in that that uh village fate scene it could have a lot could have been made out of that um i think t just just one comment about the, the movie it's outstandingly good acting by don andrews as dr holden he really is brilliant in my opinion mm, uh, it's yeah. worth worth watching the movie just to see his steady transition from total skepticism to unwilling belief it's, it's done in a masterly manner and there wasn't room for that you couldn't have that in a short story you have to have a full length movie hmm. to have that so the only thing you can you know when you look at two pieces of work that are so different really the only way you can compare them is by the story because the short story doesn't have the visual effects. It doesn't have the the like um, yeah. cinematic component. It doesn't have the music. So we, I'm cutting out all that yeah. out of the equation. The only way I'm comparing these two is by story to story basis. And simply on story to story basis, casting the rooms cannot hold a candle because there are many scenes that have been added that are like they add so much more context and they they make the story so much more compelling than the, than the short story it's 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 in my opinion actually it's it's quite um what is it unfair to compare them in, in some instances because like so for example which 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 scenes am i talking about right so uh the the exchange between carswell and his mother we have no other main characters there it's just carswell and his mother and his mother is like scared to death and she says to him like you know you can still get out of this you can you know like you, you don't have to do any of this and he's like i can't mother i can't right so we see our our villain in a compromised situation where he gets to be a human being and he you know he he tells his mother like it's too late it's not i can't get out of this contract i'm i'm mm. bound to this demon it's it's over for me right like if i if i end this line if i cut this line it's coming for me right so um you have none of that in the in the mm. in casting the rooms right and because it's written the way it is mm. um other other parts which were qu quite good like the really long uh, moments with holden and his you know genuine uh, short you know like slow paced transition from complete skeptic to uh i'm in grave danger uh because this is this this is turning out to be more real than i thought um right um so the that is not handled as well in, in casting the rooms uh, casting the rooms there's a bunch of places where uh, exposition is basically given to us and then the exposition is taken at face value by the characters and they just 
take it on its stride like it's okay this is real like, you know there's no need for that much contemplation uh, now we're just fighting this curse right so for me uh, what's it called uh, yeah uh, the the effects are wonky uh, what's it called some stuff is outdated in the movie I completely agree with XJ but you can't compare that in Casting the Ruins. Where are the special effects in Casting the Ruins? There isn't any. Where's the the music in uh, Casting the Ruins? There isn't any. You can't compare them. So if we're if we're fighting one against the other, you gotta you gotta really, um, in my opinion at least, right? Uh, look at the way they portray the same story. I don't agree that there's no music in the story. I think the mm -hmm. style is the music, and you can't get that in the movie unless you had a movie full of voiceovers which this one isn't could you could you elaborate to the readers what you mean by the uh, readers to, to the listeners what do you mean by yes I, I i would say the the main power in mr james's writing i don't agree with xj that it's anything like the ornate uh, prose of clark ashton smith <laughs> well they've got this much in common that they're both I guess yes. I guess uh, Robert has a higher standard than I do. I'm just yeah. a, I'm just a fast food enjoyer of beautiful prose. Well, yes, I'm <laughs> a a prose. Um, and and M R James's prose is works. Uh, you can sum it up in in one word, really. Understatement. That's how he achieves his effects. Uh, uh, he, he his timing of little little tiddly hints to the reader mm. and how in one point in the story i can't remember what it is but uh, done it's explained to dunning that one of the effects of these uh, of carswell's handing out these runes is it, it may bring the the recipient into very undesirable company now that's a beautifully understated phrase um and uh if I just may read, um, uh, yes, more than once on the way home that day, Mr. Dunning confessed to himself that he did not look forward with his usual cheerfulness to a solitary evening. And that's uh, the veteran reader of M.R. James kind of appreciates that sort of sentence. It seemed to him that something ill-defined and impalpable had stepped in between him and his fellow men, had taken him in charge, so to speak. He wanted to sit close up to his neighbours in the train and in the tram, but as luck would have it, both train and car were markedly empty. Um, that sort of thing, it's just understatement and it gradually introduces a note of unease in the in the reader, uh, unease in the sense of literary unease, not, you don't really think that something bad's gonna happen to you, the reader, but you're uh, sympathizing with the unease of the characters. And of course, there's that uh, ghastly bit where he puts his, uh, in this flat, he's looking for a match and he puts his hand under a pillow um, uh, looking for it, um, for his matchbox. What he touched was, according to his account, a mouth with teeth and with hair about it, and, he declares, not the mouth of a human being. I do not think it is any use to guess what he said or did, but he was in a spare room with the door locked and his ear to it before he was clearly conscious again. So a total blank out of sheer terror. Um means that you can't there's no way of knowing what the next few minutes were like and there's that's a jamesian understatement for you how would you robert transition that scene to a to a silver screen you wouldn't you see that's the point the, to that extent, we're not comparing like with like so we have to it's like a poem written in two different languages you've got to appreciate appreciate each one in its own terms and that's what i'm best at out in this team because i i accept everything uh, so you know i don't have xj's um disgust at the movie i just lap it all up and i don't have your reservations about the story i just lap 
that up as well. I'm a kind of champion lapper up of everything. <laughs> That's that's why XJ and I always clash. And, and uh, yeah, I might as well as clash with you now because I disagree oh, with yeah. you. I disagree with you on uh, your take earlier. Uh, so okay. first of all, first of all, I think there is a very uh, so first of all your your point about giving the hum giving some humanity to Caswell and then the transition from Holden uh, for, uh, Holden's uh, a state from uh, skepticism to believer. The thing is, those two are completely different characters from in the story. Like, Carswell mm -hmm. is the irredeemable a-hole in the story. There is no humanity to him. And it's very obvious right from the start. So there is no character arc for... There is, there is no room for that for Carswell. He is just a, he is just a piece of trash. And mm. Holden's character... Is very different from uh, Dunning. Dunning. Dunning is a much more. Uh, what's the word? I'm it's sure. a much more passive guy. It's like, uh, mm. yeah, life. You know, I like my evening stroll. I like my breakfast and I like my tea at four o'clock, and that's all I want. And then all of a sudden, this kind of stuff came upon him, and then he's like, <gasps> right, but. You do you. The the thing I disagree with you about is that there is no such transition in the story because there is in the beginning. Dunning, uh, was extremely he, he. One of the other scenes that didn't make it into the book was was Dunning was in the car uh, was in the bus, and then this strange lettering on the bus ads, uh. Uh, stop, uh, 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 which then disappears when mm. he went and got some people to look at that transition from some puzzlement to 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 a sort of very uh, to a sort of tension and being very frightened for his life. That is that emotional transition for you, Nikki. It's just a different kind of emotional transition. Mm. So mm. I I in it you. I don't think you can say that the short story doesn't have that because it does. It it has it for Dunning. And if you are going to make the comparison that you cannot really compare between um, the silver screen and uh, and uh, short story because they're two different formats, then I don't see how we can compare uh, that sort of character development, if you will, since the characters are so different. Mm. Okay, uh, I didn't. I think it was Robert who said that we can't compare them. All I said was that we have to be very specific in the criteria in which we. Uh, Fair enough. Compared. Fair enough. Um, yeah, but so, so and, you, anyway, oh, I on, I think on. I think like I I think like then in that case, what I would say is I don't think you can make a comparison between the two in terms of uh, three dimensional humanness or whatever. Because in the first place, Carswell was not written as a three-dimensional character. He wa he is just straight out a bad guy, mm. and right, then sure. and that. But Dunning has that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just a, it's a different kind. It's a different kind because uh, Holden was a much more gives gives off give gives off that feeling of a much more active protagonist like he's actually going out there doing things whereas Dunning was way more uh, things just kind of happen to me and then I react kind of mm -hmm. protagonist mm. Mm. sure okay so mm. if you want to make the argument which I, I, I can uh, uh, get behind that Dunning does have an arc and that uh, um, oh What's his name? Uh, Carswell doesn't have a an arc at all uh, because he he's like at the comp he has his journey as a character complete in the short story already from the beginning because he's a bad guy he can't change. Except all that, that's not a problem. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, to me, uh, it's it's simply done better. It is done differently, definitely. Uh, but I'm not trying to compare them for for like for like. I'm trying to compare them which one I think. Um, gets mm -hmm. gets to the to the person uh, consuming the media better 
And for me, the the movie does both of those characters better than the than the short story, regardless uh, if they are similar or not similar in both medias. Um, Carswell would have benefited in the, in the movie. I will give you, I will grant you that to be a little bit more evil. I agree, and especially with this whole like, uh, but not nefariously evil. So I like the fact like. How he is sort of like playing with the with, with the children at that party right right at the beginning. One of the beginning scenes uh, of the movie is uh, you know uh, he's sort of like doing this this party for for a, a bunch of uh, individuals. And um, if it was just a little bit more scary for the children, and and if he was like relishing just a little bit more in in that whole situation, having power over these um, sort of like young minds. Uh, I think the story would definitely benefit. Mm-hmm. I think the movie would definitely benefit from that. Him being sort of like, um, you know, sort of foreshadowing how he treats other individuals in the entire story. Because the entire time, uh, Carswell in the movie treats everyone like they're children, like they're beneath him. Like mm-hmm. he, he tells uh, Holden, like, you're going to die in three days. Um, there's not much you can do about it. Mm-hmm. So I suggest, uh, you know, you reconsider your investigation. Otherwise, what I'm, why, what I said will pass. You know, there's n- nothing about it. Don't, uh, don't uh, misunderstand me. My, uh, this is not a threat. It's a promise, right? Which is pretty powerful, right? Um, mm-hmm. And if if the diversion didn't happen at the end of the movie, supposedly Holden would have died, right, from the demon. I think that's kind of mm-hmm. the implication. Um, and to me, if we show if we show him doing that more to other people, where he doesn't have to do it, but he's still doing it, it would have painted him a much better, a much more uh, sort of like complex uh, villain, where we see he is sort of like relishing in this power. Um, mm-hmm. So that, I'll I'll grant you that. Mm-hmm. Um, in in effect, um, the best character in the in the in the movie. Uh, besides uh, Holden, who's played by Dan Andrews, uh, is uh, Joanna for me. I think Joanna really adds a lot to the story. And that's sort of like uh, the end point for me. The switch from Harrington's brother to Joanna is such a great step for the movie and for the story overall. Um, It really impacts everything um, in, in myriad ways. So first of all, we have this really tenuous connection uh, to to the beginning, right? We don't have this uh, broken up uh, sequence like we have in the casting the rooms, uh, where the prologue like basically has nothing to do with the rest of the story, uh, because the it kind of continues through Joanna, because Joanna is introduced rather early. She is the niece of this Harrington, and we meet her at the last time that we see Harrington himself, which is at his funeral, right? And from then on point on, her development enriches the story. Uh, she is the non-skeptic. She is the person who believes uh, about it uh, all from the start. She is the one concerned for Holden. Um, and uh, if, I, if I may analyze, I think the, at least the way the screenplay tries to pr- portray it is Joanna... Uh, sort of becomes involved with Holden because she likes the fact that he's determined and that he's he's a skeptic and that he's a strong individual, right? So that's what she likes about him as a as a man. And that's why she continues sort of like working with him. But she also has the other component of liking him because she's afraid for him because she has just lost some other significant person in her life exactly through this situation, right? And mm-hmm. that really sells joanna's character arc entirely for for me throughout throughout this whole uh story like uh, most other uh characters um uh when it when it comes comes to helping the main hero uh in movies of this time they don't have this motivation that that is so transparent so clear and believable um and to me her um existence uh really makes the movie thrice better so uh, I guess that that is another character who really benefits from the expansion of 
their their character. Now there isn't Joanna in in casting the runes, but we have if we have to sort of like loosely compare her to somebody, it has to be the brother, right? And although the brother has really good zingers, he has really good lines. One of which uh, Robert read. We don't really know much about him and how much he misses his brother. There isn't this sort of like deep conversation between him and uh, Dunning where he, he sort of like, you know, says how he misses his brother or how, you know, he attended his hu- funeral and how that affected him. We don't see that. But in the movie, we see Joanna struggle from the start. She just lost him to like, oh, I'm about to lose somebody else that I'm getting involved with. And this is scaring me. Right. So mm. I scary. think it's there. I think what the the his Harrington's brother's concern for his brother is there, but it's like the very Jamesian uh thing, like Rob said, you ha- kind of have to look beyond the 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 sentence itself to find it because it's very understated. Mm. And and the reason I say that is there is because you it, when when uh. Dunning was introduced to Harrington's brother for the first time through words from the secretary. No, not the secretary. Uh, the uh, the guy that did the uh, magazine for that published uh, the review for um, for Dunning. He described Harrington's brother as being very obsessive about. Uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 trying to find cars the identity of Carswell I think like trying to investigate like he he really thinks there's more to this than than what the uh, the police the and the autopsy and everything had 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 uh, mm-hmm. given to the public like he really thinks there's more and then he kept at it and I don't think if you're not if you're not motivated in any way I mean if you're not uh, concerned about uh, that person in that who just died in any way I don't think you'll be motivated enough to go through all that so so there is some of that it's just uh, it's it's uh, it's just not as obvious as it is in the in in the movie where it's like shown right in front of you it like uh, like a lot of um mr james's stuff you kind of have to read it and then extrapolate that for yourself i feel mm. anyway mm. there's all i think this links what you're saying links with uh nikki's criticism that well I don't know if it's criticism but that uh, it, the the story is slow paced um and that the the prologue is more or less extraneous and unnecessary to the, the meat of the story. The reason I I don't agree with that is because if you like M. R. James' stories at all, you like them because of the what you might call the mood music, which is uh, very much linked to records, documents, that sort of thing, and to architecture, to to the built environment, to to things that that aren't animate, but that seem to have a an animate significance in a way, and the um, the sort of leisurely aspects of the story may seem by definition slow moving, but actually in in emotional terms, mm-hmm. a lot is happening uh, to the reader. Yeah, I think like. I think that, I mean, I I I think uh, M. R. James's style is basically to write in that very understated way that uh, Robert uh, described. And thank you for giving me that word because I I wouldn't know how to describe it. Um, I I don't think he lacks the ability. Let's just put that out of the. Uh, Let's just put that out of the way because I don't think he lacks the ability to create uh, emotional links between people and then uh, within characters within his story and then to bring that out to reader because if if he could if he is unable to do that 
then there will be no tension at all in that train scene, nor would there be any of that creepiness in Lost Heart. Mm. I, mm. I think I think he can. He, I think he can do it. He he just does it in a different way from the movie. Mm. Yeah, it's not like Star Wars where action consists of, you know, um, pew pew pews, explosions and firing hey, lasers what, and things. What? You know. Robert, what's wrong with you? You're gonna, you're gonna attack uh, Star Wars? I don't know <laughs> which one. Which 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 Star Wars are you referring to exactly? Which, uh, which the first one? one. Yeah. First ah, New Hope. Okay. Mm. All right. So what what do you hate about Star Wars? Let's go on this. I don't. I like it. I'm just yeah. saying that if you say that a story doesn't have a lot of action in, yeah. um, that that's it depends what sort of action you're talking about. Mm. If yeah. if your blood pressure goes up reading something. Or if your heart beats faster, then really effectively that's action, even if uh, it wouldn't look like action in a movie. I definitely would say that there there is uh, there is an action scene in the short story, and that is what uh, XJ described uh, d- during the exchange, uh, where where mm-hmm. Carswell is tricked, right? Uh, where he sort of like several times he he might ca- catch our our guys. Uh, you know, it's a suspense doing, scene, yeah. isn't it? It's not yeah, action; yeah. it's suspense. But it is action mm-hmm. because yeah. because it's um it's a what's it called? Um, oh God, what's it called? Um, to me, uh, an action scene is is something that can be at least uh, filmed in a in a way w- where you can have a lot of quick cuts and a lot of uh, sort of like tension building in in a situation, right? Um, I guess if you're if if it's a more narrow uh, idea of an action scene, like you know, running, shooting, uh, exploding, fighting, blah blah blah, then fair enough. Yeah, there is no uh, mm. there is no action scene. But I mean, um, you know, it, 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 I guess it depends on the turn. Regardless, uh, mm. and I have a tangent. Uh, so, um, Robert, you you you. You know, aired on the side of caution, and don't think I haven't noticed. You haven't uh, given your vote uh, to either of the two so far. I mean, it's quite clear to me that XJ is definitely for uh, the story, and in my heart mm. of hearts, I know that uh, Night of the Demon uh, mm. is winning. In my, in my. Uh... Well, I I tend to read much more than I watch movies, but I mm. do like. I really do like. I love, in fact, a good movie, and. Especially if it's a movie made in way back when, like in 1957, when actors actually could talk comprehensible English instead of just <laughs> slurring in a sort of Russell Crowe type manner. They could actually talk English and one could actually sit there and, and understand what they're saying. And that's a tremendous advantage which old movies have over more recent ones. Oh, and also, yeah. wasn't it in black and white? Uh, it was. Night of the Demon? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's another advantage, you see. You don't have all this distracting uh, colour, which um, kind of spoils the mood. I'm, I'm just being slightly uh, contrarian here. Uh, yeah, you're, you're putting a lot of shade on that. No, I yeah. absolutely agree. The, the black and white film does way, would do way more for it than the uh, colour. You know, I what a movie you you might actually enjoy, uh, Robert. That has been well, actually, you might enjoy it too. That has been released quite recently, but it is in black and white. Uh, I think it's called The Lighthouse. Mm. It's a it's a it's a very good horror movie. Uh, it's very creepy, very eerie. Um, they don't speak proper English because they're American. Um, <laughs> well, hold on, Americans used to be able to speak proper English, but in the prime room. <laughs> If you if you look at High Noon, um, Gary Cooper and all his fellow stars, they all speak perfectly. Oh, that's uh, that's a little bit uh, that's a little bit of out of nowhere. <laughs> it, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I got that reaction. Right. Actually, I, I was you know. Listen, me, Lock, it's not the accent I'm talking about. It's the <laughs> diction. Yeah. No, I I actually agree with Robert there because uh, one one thing I did notice about the movie was wow, the actors actually speak their lines very clearly, even yeah. even the not even the ones that are not um, 
uh, the the main cast like uh, I can't remember his name, but there was a guy. There was a guy when Holden was in his hotel. He's a little bit pudgy, uh, no hair on on this side, but like a fuzzle around around uh, on the sides of his head. One of the other professors, uh, yeah, Henry Henry Harrington was it? No, I I I I don't remember. But he, I was very surprised because. He his diction was really good, and I was, was like, "That's Mar- just was a it Mark O'Brien." Anyway, sorry, I don't, sure. I don't remember, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Wow, wow!" The the speaking, the ability to communicate clearly was much better way back then. Mm-hmm. Actors were trained to do it in those days. Yeah. Now, and 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 I'm thinking about my favorite uh, black and white show right now which is 12 angry men and i'm like yep yep Yep. really good diction there yes yeah that's right even gangsters used to speak properly like you know in (laughs) james Cockney movies yeah so yeah absolutely it does help uh and just like we discussed with lost lost hearts that it uh, it being like a mansion uh, you know that you could you could have actually seen in the real world. Um, I wanted to talk about the location in the in the movie for the exterior mm. views of the Doctor Caswell Mansion because it's a it's a really nice mansion. Uh, mm. it's, as as uh, Morgan says, I don't know what his racket is, but it sure pays well. Doesn't yeah, it? exactly. Um, uh, that that's a really good line as well. Yeah, uh, it's uh, Brocket Brocket Hall Hatfield uh, in England. Which oh. is a really beautiful place. I mm. recommend uh, googling it. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, that's I'm, also I'm a place. A that's also a place in Canada that I recommend googling. It's called the River uh, Vale uh, Asylum. That uh, anytime you see, basically anytime you see a uh, a rundown, uh, broken place, dilapidated uh, building. Uh, in either a movie or a television show, is shot there. <laughs> yeah. cool. well. All right, so let's not dilly dally any longer. Follow All right, yeah, you. we are coming out on the hour. So last uh, last words, gentlemen. Yeah, I mean, we we gotta give uh, what's it called? What what we would like more and why in a in a short and beautiful manner. Uh, I'll start. So yeah. casting the runes. I'll, I'll read them both out of him. There you go. That's how it is. So mm. Casting the Runes um, is a solid uh, 6.5 out of 10 uh, s- short story um, that uh, is a good read once. Uh, I would not read it a second time if I didn't have to do it for the podcast. Mm. Um, and probably not because uh, it's bad or something, but because it's too long um, 30 for me. Pages. Yeah too long for me uh when it when it comes to the pace not not when it comes to uh the amount of uh words uh, like um let's let's put it this way it's too slow for me uh, mm. the the lost hearts was a was perfectly paced this i feel like the pacing jumps all over the place and especially at the beginning and because it happens especially at the beginning that's where my brain turns off you know mm. like if i'm reading something and at the beginning it doesn't the pace isn't good enough. It's uh, it slows down for me. So that's kind of why it's not a seven. And it's a six point five. You want to say something, Rob? Who me? Yeah. Um, I'd I'd give them both. Um, I'd give the story ten out of ten because I really like M. I. James, <laughs> and this is one of my favourite M. I. James. <laughs> You, um, I can't take your uh, review seriously. Everything is going to be 10 out of 10. No. Uh, as for the movie, I'd give it sort of 9.5 out of 10. So, so see? Few, see? A few see? things with it. But Scandal is very, very good. Scandalous. Scandalous not probably. 10? Yeah, not, okay. not 10. Um, I forgot to say the movie. The movie is 8.5. Because mm. mm. oh. it's great. Mm. So I like the movie even more than you do, Nikki. Yeah. What do you mean? My scales yeah. are completely yeah. different. You're like 10 out of 10, 9.5 out of 10. What is this stuff? No, I, I gave it 9.5 out of 10. Yeah, but I gave the story 6.5 out of 10 compared to 8.5 to, uh, of the of the yeah. movie. 
Well, the story I... just has half a point more than the movie, but I mean, that still means they're both outstanding. Okay. So, so why did you give the movie a two, XJ? I didn't give it a two. I give it a zero. <laughs> Golly. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. The introduction of the demon at the beginning just killed everything for me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind a slow start. I don't mind a slow start. I. I quite. Uh, I'll give the short story eight out of ten. And the only reason I'm not giving it higher is because of the way it sort of breaks in between. Uh, where it jumps from one thing to the other, like the like the way it just skips. This is by the way of the prologue. Let's let's go to the other part. I thought that was like ah no, lazy, lazy, Mister James, and um oh. and uh I can't I can't I I really can't give I really can't give a, any score at all to the movie because like it it's like it's like. It's like there is another there is another movie that did itself a massive disfavor in in film history that basically destroyed itself. It's called Soylent Green, and and I'm not gonna spoil the story for you. But the trailer, the studio release, just basically killed the story for everybody. And this is the same thing for me. It's like oh, the it demon reveal. Yeah, the demon, the demon reveal was what destroyed any sort of suspense I thought could have been built up within the story mm. and and specific only to me as well like the the puppeteering is kind of bad uh, outdated I wouldn't say it's bad it's outdated and then it's, that also just sort of kills every every uh, uh, any sort of realism for me and I, I thought the whole thing would have been much better if it was just a lot of smoke so so let me be a little bit generous, just a little bit. Oh, that very beginning when it was just a silhouette in smoke. Oh, that was super. That cool. I, I was worked. Say that the the worst decision they made was to show the damn puppet right in your face like a full frontal shot. I completely agree, actually, with you. I would say that it, it would be so much cooler if Harrington just saw the thing approaching, and that's all we saw. Yeah. And you could say, oh, well, he's just imagining stuff. It's just mist. So, right? like, so yeah, so the decision yeah. to actually mm -hmm. show the demon, uh, if it has to be done... It needs to be done at the end because like you do it right in the beginning you show everything is basically you're showing all your hands and that's just bad that's yeah. i think one one thing rescues the movie from that i agree xj from, with most of what you say one thing rescues the movie from it and that is that in the middle of the bit where the demon is ripping harrington to pieces you suddenly get a chop and suddenly a complete change of scene and you see a complete change of atmosphere, and that that kind of that contrast is is uh, is like it rescues it to me. For uh, me, that's fair enough. Uh, but the damage was done basically by showing mm. the demon in the first place. So if they had only just shown that silhouette, it would have mm. worked way better. Yeah, but as yeah. it is, but as it is, like the full show of hands is like kill any sort of uh uh emotional uh, uh rise i might get out of the movie and that's why it's zero in contrast mm -hmm. the short story might have been slow at the start but the train station that the the train thing the train carriage scene was done superbly and it was done mm -hmm. so well that Every, now, because I read this short story two weeks ago, mm -hmm. I I saw the movie last night. So the movie was way fresher in my mind. And even to today, I can still remember in vivid detail the 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 carriage the carriage scene. I like I other than the demon thing, I can't really recall much of the movie. And for me, that is a benchmark for whether I, uh, something hits me or not. If I remember it, mm. yeah. So that's my take. Yeah. Fair enough. 
Okay. Well, uh, dear listeners, both of these works are in the public domain, and we'll provide links down below so that you could have a look and decide for yourself uh, who was right and who was wrong. And <laughs> sure, Nikki. Sure. All right. Well, okay. Uh, we're coming up more than an hour, and uh, it's time to say adios, my friends. Adios. This is Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. Thank you for listening. <laughs>